Um, so I will talk about the taxonomy database at NCBI. Um, so that's uh, the, home uh, the home page of our database. Um, currently, um, the NCBI taxonomy database serves all three partners of the collaboration. We handle consults from DDBJ in Japan, as well as Europe, ENA. And then we also handle um, taxonomy consults from our internal databases uh, at NCBI in the USA. So every day curators get consults coming in from uh, three different places geographically. Um, so I should also say in the previous slide, the taxonomy was chosen to be a central hub of the data in the databases so that there's shared uh, classifications used by all the databases. So, so far uh, in the taxonomy database, we have almost 400,000 species, the majority of which is animals, followed by plants, fungi, and then prokaryotes and viruses. As you can see, the increase has been fairly steady. In spite of the increase in sequences, it's a, it's a fairly steady rise in species. And we foresee that it will continue to rise um, and maybe leveling off at, at some point. So I will continue to talk now about how do we organize and describe these species names. So now I have to go back in history. Um, taxonomy is a, it's a discipline that looks forward and backward. We rely on some very old principles that was introduced by this uh, man, Carl von Linne, Linnaeus, um, and that's almost 300 years ago, predates a lot of concepts in modern biology. But we still apply the classification that he introduced. On the right-hand side there, you can see the different hierarchical structures that's used to organize biological uh, information Species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, and then kingdom. There's some intermediate um, ones too, but that is basic, the basic structure that we generally apply in the NCBI taxonomy database. Of course, since Linnaeus predates a lot of ideas of modern biology, a lot of these um, terms have changed their meanings. So even though we use the structure, we, we apply it in a different way than we did 300 years ago. So Darwin, Enik, and many other biologists have changed the way that we think about species. And we have to adapt to that as well. Um, the way that species are described rely on a very intricate set of rules. And these rules apply to different sets of organisms. So, Taxonomists and curators at the taxonomy database rely on three main codes. These codes accurate, uh, intricately describe how you describe a species, in what cases a name is correct, and when it's incorrect, it's almost like a set of laws that apply to whether you can accept a name or not. So we have uh, a, a specific code for animals, the zoology code, a code for fungi, algae, and plants, international code, and then a code for prokaryotes. There's also a list of names for viruses, uh, which is a more informal structure, so it doesn't really meet the requirements of a code, but we uh, regularly uh, interact with the virus, the ICTV, um, the International Committee for Virus Taxonomy as well. So just to um, reiterate, the way that species are named in a very basic way. You follow the code if you are a scientist who wants to name a new undiscovered species, you follow the code that applies to your species. The very important part is using a single specimen that will then act as a standard for the species. Uh, it's called the type. So this type is tied to the name. And when you do additional comparative biology, you can compare it to the single specimen. Record 
the characters of the species. This is the distinctive characters that makes your species different from other species. And then finally, you propose a scientific name. So um, this rather interesting tree I've used for the backdrop for my slides is uh, found in the, uh, the Socotra archipelago just off the coast of Yemen. It's commonly known as the Socotra dragon tree, uh, also the dragon blood tree. It produces this really uh, red resin that's used for locally for all sorts of ailments. Um, but as you can see, there's a number of common names that's applied to this, to this species. It's not always clear in what, uh, what species it refers to. Sometimes it's used multiple ways for other species. What you really need is a scientific name. In this case, it's been named Dracaena cinnabari. You can actually go and look at the original description once you have that scientific name, and you can see what characters was defined in 1835 when it was first described. So here's the original description. Once you have that information, you can go and look at the sequences that's produced for this species. So here we have an entry in the NCBI taxonomy. There's uh, six nucleotide sequences for this species. There's a number of other uh, additional information that you can go to. Other databases, we link out to other databases where you can meet, get more information about this interesting tree. Um, and, and you can see how much other people have produced about the specific species already. So there's the highlight of the molecular data that's in the databases. There's also publications listed there, there and a number of other um, sources of information. So even though scientific names are a very precise way to name species, there's some limitations to using the codes. And these codes do not overlap, so they do not recognize names that was produced in other codes. So sometimes you have uh, interesting problems. So here we have two separate unrelated species. One is a stick insect but that was described in the zoological code. A second is a bacterium that was described under the code for prokaryotes. They share a genus name, Bacillus. In this case, Bacillus rossius and Bacillus anthracus. Um, so the database and the curators of the database has to be aware that this is a shared genus name. These two species are totally unrelated, but we need to adapt to redundancies that's generated like this. So the database needs to be aware of this as well. Another point I want to make here is that these names and these classification names are not always a total equivalents. So if we look at genetic diversity, here's an example where we compare yeasts to chordates. So on the right-hand side, you see higher animals from humans to sea squirts to pufferfish. Uh, one, if we take the proteins, the, uh, the similar proteins, that's in the genomes of these species. And if we go up uh, in the slide towards the top, uh, the, the percentage identity goes down between these different species. On this side, we have yeasts. And in this case, it's a class, class of yeasts. So as I've shown in the previous Linnaean classification, a class is a smaller, um, a smaller label it, it contains less, uh, a lesser diversity, supposedly, than a phylum. But in this case, genetic diversity is more in this class of yeasts. Phenotypic diversity is very high on this side. It's much lower on this side. These organisms look very similar, but they have a high level of genetic and, and metabolic diversity. So it's important to remember that there are some limitations in the way that these classifications work, mainly due to the characters of the different kinds of organisms that we work with and the history of how we describe them to begin with. So um, I'd also like to indicate that there's a number of interesting ways that scientific names, in addition to common names being interesting, you can actually find some interesting uh, scientific names. So I just uh, looked at a couple that's in our database currently. 
Uh, here's one boops, boops is a fish. You can see there's a picture. Uh, mops, mops is a bat. So, uh, we have a specific species that was named after movie characters. Here we have one that was named after Godzilla. It's a crustacean uh, found in marine caves, and it's been seen um, in fossils 200 million years ago. There's another species here that was named after Chewbacca, a Star Wars character. Um, we also have uh, very short names, such as this one. It's another bat species, Aya Ayo. And then this very long uh, species, now I'm a Lecospermum species, which I will not try to read from here. So, um, why do these names matter? And we use these names in all sorts of ways outside of biology. They do not just matter to biologists. So here we have our interestingly named bat again, Mops Mops. Uh, it's it's an uh, endangered species. So in this case, it's important to know this name is tied to a specific species. Uh, and ecologists and environmental regulators need to know uh, what's related to this name. Another, another case where names are important is in trade and quarantine. So um, plant protection agencies throughout the world are very concerned about diseases moving around. In this case, I just grabbed the headlines from another, uh, a number of plant diseases that, that's causing concern across the world. Um, um, Panama disease uh, affecting bananas, rust affecting wheat, and another rust affecting coffee. Um, these uh, regulatory agencies that look at trade have lists of names when they try to see whether these organisms are being introduced uh, into countries. So these names have to be correct and they have to be up to date. So part of the, the uh, quest for accuracy is that this, the name is not enough. The name needs to be tied to something. And as I've mentioned before, when a species is described, it's always described uh, with, uh, in relation to a specific specimen. So if we have in our database a clear distinction between a species name, a specimen, and then the data, we can go ahead and, and improve the accuracy of other related things by doing comparisons. So those kind of relationships are incredibly important. And here's a, a recent uh, article in the Scientist uh, magazine where they are bemoaning the fact that there's a number of mislabeled things in the public sequence databases and that it's affecting accurate science. So, so we are now uh, at a point where we can start to correct bacterial genomes. We have a very good idea of all the types for bacteria. We can start to compare genomes from types to other species. So here's a tool that's been used. I'm not sure how visible it is, but the blue lines is a genome from type, and then all the red lines are incorrect. And here's probably a better example, where we have a single Escherichia coli uh, genome nested within a bunch of Klebsiella pneumonia genomes. So if we have uh, a type sequence in here as well, we can be certain that this um, genome do not correspond to the described characters of um, Acerichia coli, but is likely a Klebsiella pneumoniae. So we are in the process of correcting some of these things. My colleagues, uh, Karen Clark and Eileen Masrachi, after me, will go into more practical examples of how we are using uh, sequence data in the databases um, to correct and to, and to explore biological information. So with that, I will leave you with this final quote, um, which was uh, spoken many years ago, but I think it still applies today. Um, Nomina sinescis perit e cognitio rerum, or in English, if you do not know the names of things, the knowledge of them is lost to you. And I'll pass on to Aline.